Hi everyone, how are you? Hope everyone is fine. Um, sharing the room and so on. So we'll start in around eight minutes. So thank you for coming. And in the meantime, you can check out our guest speaker's website. He has really amazing research um, projects, overviews on there that you can check out. Um, they are really interesting. So. I really recommend checking those out. Thank you. Everyone will start in around three minutes. 
Um, thank you for coming. In the meantime, I recommend checking out the website that is pinned on top of the room. That is the website of our guest speaker. And you can see there an overview of his different um, projects he's working on. Uh, hi, Richard. How are you? Thanks for coming. Hi, Catalina. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Perfect. That's really nice. Um, hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I had a good day. Yeah, so it's uh, evening in Germany, so it's uh, <laughs> so everything's nice. I can have a quiet place uh, to participate in the clubhouse. Nice. Um, I grew up in Germany. I don't know if I told you what. Um, wow, no, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my parents still live there and my brothers still live wow. in Germany. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you like <laughs> yes, it. so far so good. How long are you in Germany now? Well, it's, it's, it hasn't been long. It's a little bit more than half a year. But before, you know, I live in Switzerland, so it's not much difference. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Well, Switzerland is really nice. I, I mm -hmm. like Switzerland a lot. It's, uh, yeah, I really like it. We used to go every year. Oh, absolutely. Mm. <laughs> so you know how to speak German now? Is it... Not really, unfortunately. It's not a very intuitive language to learn. <laughs> no, no, before I think I only know how to speak something like, um, uh, can I order like a crispy chicken wrap? Like, um, that, that's, yeah, that's a, I, I really have horrible. I, I did not really pay much attention <laughs> to that. Well, it's fine. It's not like it's very useful for the, like, it's just Germany, Austria, and Switzerland where you can speak mm -hmm. it. Like, yeah, but, yeah. You know. <laughs> and for your work, you <laughs> don't really need it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's really lost a lot of motivation. Otherwise, I think I'll pay a lot. I will spend, yeah, you know, definitely some time to learn German. Yeah. And uh, is the heat wave over in, in, in Germany? Oh, well, I'm not so sure, at least for this week, definitely at this uh, week and last week is, um, yeah, last week's a, it's pretty bad. It's got really hot. Um, and, uh, yeah, I have to, I, sometimes at my, all like, uh, uh, my schedule had really changed because I, I really, it's hard to fall asleep, uh, at night. I have to, uh, get up a little bit late because then, you know, I can have a proper good sleep and then change a little bit working hours a bit. <laughs> Because of the heat wave. Yeah, there's no AC, right? That's the problem. The people mm. don't have ACs in Germany, so. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and then it's very humid. It's like inland, like it's not by the. Oh, ocean, so. exactly. I think, yeah, because I live in Constance, so even uh, worse, I think the lake has a lot of humidity. Uh, it can make things quite hot, actually. <laughs> yeah. But it's such a, it's like probably the best area in Germany to be is Konstanz. <laughs> yes, that's, this is really a beautiful place. And the, the lake is so nice. And I even swim in it. It's, it feels really great. But the lake is kind of cool though, right? I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. Lake so Alexa Blast is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I love Konstanz and that region is pretty, really <laughs> <laughs> well, you must miss 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 the, the life in Europe now, huh? Yeah, yeah, I I do. Uh, and with COVID and stuff, you know, travel was kind of not too much. Mm. Um, because then you get stuck, and then you're not back in time for work again. You know, it's like. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping to go back to Europe this winter. So, mm -hmm. but mostly to Portugal. Usually, our family then meets in Portugal. Um, yeah, sure. You know, around Christmas, yeah. I think that's a great place to visit. Yeah. So usually, I I don't go much back to Germany, but <laughs> I have to make time. <laughs> okay, I think we can slowly start. Um, Absolutely. Then, um. Yeah, and then. Um, Maybe. 
<laughs> next time we talk some more about travel. <laughs> of course, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone to Science Society, and of course, a special welcome uh, to you, Richard. Um, Thank so, you. before we start, uh, let me um, give our audience a little bit of um, some information about you so they get to know you a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, Dr. Richard Gu. He's a postdoc uh, in the physics department at the University of Constance, and he works with Professor Clemens Bechinger. Um, exactly. And um, he studied mechatronic engineering at the Zhejiang University, uh, mm -hmm. and during his bachelor, um, he joined. Um, a young scientist exchange program in Tokyo Institute of Technology. And um, as an exchange student, he worked on the microfabrication and electrohydrodynamic systems. And later on, he then um, did his master's in, in micro and nano systems at the ETH uh, Zurich. And um, he did his PhD at Multiscale Robotics Lab at ETH Zurich uh, with Professor uh, Brad Nelson. And during his PhD, he also worked as an editor, editorial assistant to Brad. And um, his interests um, in his work or research um, um, are magnetic assemblies and structured magnetic materials swarm micro-robotic locomotion, artificial cilia systems, magnetic soft robotics for biomedical applications. And I pinned on top of the room um, the website where you can find um, um, a lot of um, information about all the, about the different projects. But I will switch now to um, to another link and I will we'll post this link then to the chat so people can access it later on. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, thank you again, Richard, for being here. And thank you so much, Katarina. Um, and usually before we start, we'll ask a couple of interview questions if that's okay with you. Of course, of course. So um, when did you realize that you um, that like science is basically your life and science engineering, was it maybe a teacher or some, some book or, you know, was there something in, or was it something you always wanted to do and it was always your thing basically? Um, oh, that's a really good question. I, I did not prepare for that. Um, I don't really know. So I think, um, uh, as far as I see, I was always interested in science, and uh, I'm a, I have a pretty strong curiosity. Uh, so, I, sometime I always want to know, you know, try to dig the bottom of it and see uh, what's what's the mechanism working behind uh, the world with the uh, you know with this uh, with the machines for everything I encounter. So I'm, I always have this very strong curiosity, and then when the years pass, I'm getting more and more. Um, interested in the oh can you hear me yes mm -hmm. oh, yeah. oh i see sometimes okay. i lost the freezer okay excellent so uh so over the years i i get you know different try with different ideas that i have you know you know in the certain stages i was getting more uh more uh interested in realizing my ideas i think scientific uh especially in engineering communities are really uh, there are many interesting things going on in the robotics and you can just uh, I, I think to me uh, that there's nothing more fun than just make some of your own small setup and machines and watch it move right you build your own robot and watch it move I think this is really uh, fun and exciting to me so yeah that's I think that's how I interest in science and uh, engineering in general that's interesting um and it, yeah, I agree. It is wonderful. I used to play with Lego a lot, and um, me yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in 
then from that, um, how is there maybe a story behind these projects? Um, how did you come to work in this specific field then or work on this specific project? Was it kind of easy to get grants for it? Um, you know, is there maybe a background story behind this project? Oh, uh, yeah, that could be, uh, that definitely, the, I think uh, the, the, the reason lead me to this lab or, you know, the way I did my PhD in, the, this in, at, in Zurich is uh, I was reading the news or the papers at the time and I really find something really exciting that people make this microscopic machine and uh, how I can move it. Uh, and it uh, and uh, and I get used to this like a micro system, which you use the microfabrication techniques to make something fabricated in small scale. Like a uh, well, of course, initially they are originated from this integrated circuits to like photolithography, microfabrication, and then uh, many mechanical engineers join in the community to trying to make something you know a mechanical system that is functional, like this digital mirror arrays for the projectors. Just many successes also for with this like MAMS uh, gyroscope sensor that which is in aerophone right now and the, the field is really gradually evolving and around 10 years ago this microbiotics really coming to uh, I think that the stage is uh, people uh, I mean they know how to make let's say static structures uh, you can integrate many micro or uh, actuator into a system which is overall on the chip which is not really moving but then consider another case like how to you can how to make something like mobile and move along the way and that really like um, this idea which some people say they can be traced back to this fantastic voyage with this all the uh, uh, have uh, uh, this a uh, fiction uh, movie, uh, but I, I think they're really just the curiosity how you can make something move, make a really small scale object move in that scale that you have very limited space. That you cannot put standard method. You can have a battery, have an actuator, have a sensor, have a microcontroller to put into a, a small, very very tiny microscopic object and. Uh, and then they trigger a lot of fundamental question how to make the move and then uh engineers uh especially like what at the time i think my supervisor brad nelson was really a pioneer in the field um they they propose many ways you especially use magnetic methods to control and move to small scale objects and uh and that was really exciting for me because you just see how they get insp inspired by nature and create this all this stuff so i think this kind of the idea uh that to engineer in the microscopic system that we don't encounter in everyday life, right? So what we encounter is more like a you know meter scale or at least a centimeter scale object. So our intuition, which we gain from the daily life, they are not very useful in terms of design small scale objects. And uh, sometimes it could be super counterintuitive because the scaling effect, right? At the small scale, like the viscous is really dominant and, and the things can change drastically. And that's how, let's say, of course, for, as an engineer, if you don't find a good solution, then you look at nature because they already optimized after, you know, millions of years. And, uh, and then people start to mimicking the bacteria, flagella, how to make things move or the sperm, how they propel. And this is a whole field just started. And then, and then people right now, people are in the stage to explore potential application for that, to use those kind of uh, micro robot to, uh, make potential medical application to carry drugs to as lab on the chip uh, manipulation uh, micro manipulation it's just uh, it's a whole quite a large field actually yeah thank you for giving us that uh, wonderful introduction and it's so fascinating such a fascinating field so i can't wait to hear your presentation so um the link for your um presentation is now um, on top of the the room so everyone can access it and um, yeah and the stage is yours um, um, and thank you thank you thank you so much katarina and uh, this is like uh, ask this very general question to guide the audience gradually get familiar with uh, the, the work that have been, i will introduce today so i think as i explained this microbiotic is getting 
uh, quite interest, more and more interesting because uh, th their potential to be used in the human body. And also as a roboticist, we use this magnetic field, we, just, we control them through external magnetic field. So um, our lab not only make the small scale micro robot, but we also focusing on this uh, magnetic system, which you build electromagnetic coils and you generate uh, you pump into the different current and then you can generate a different magnetic field around this electromagnets and then by properly control them you can have the desired magnetic field as you want so uh, those systems they are all very crucial to the applications and we are uh, there i think the whole field is also we are gradually moving from the stage that it's already very exciting to make small scale move as you wanted to thinking about the potential impact, how we can translate this to, let's say, any kind of medical application, because this kind of precision drug delivery, like this swallowable micro doctor that can just navigate inside the body and find the tumor or find whatever uh, they want and to do the uh, do the treatment, it's a very, like a, a very exciting dream to drive many scientists and engineers to working towards that direction. So today, I would like to introduce uh, our recent work on this direction, some recent development on uh, in this uh, in this background about how we can robustly control those micro robots or deliver those micro robots into uh, inside the body in a very unpredicted uh, environment. So uh, I will start with this: a fantastic voyage. It's a very old Hollywood movie, which actually probably very early so they think uh prob maybe not the first but definitely the pioneers think of how to shrink a uh, small scale machines down and send humans uh into uh, doctors into the human body and do the treatment and uh, this uh this movie many people really like it uh it's actually pretty good in, 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 very successful at the time and uh, uh, they really planned this idea into the uh, into the in, into uh, the society that maybe one day someone can realize that and it is because a lot of work has been realized they can use uh bacteria inspired this helical propulsion like just like a corkscrew motion same principle as the bacteria swim or make something like a rolling me mechanism like uh like some small roller like a self-assemble and then uh, rolling on the surface, like how the wheels move on the ground. So those are so many type of, uh, but this need a surface. Those type of uh, move locomotion mechanism has been developed to drive the small scale machines to move. And we already see those, uh, some of maybe more small scale uh, uh, lab on the chip applications. Uh, but if you really think uh, to put yourself on board with this micro machines in the human body, I, I think this voyage is not so fantastic because there will be a chaotic case. Uh, those machines, at least for what we developed so far, they have a relatively slow speed. They basically typically a couple of uh, body lengths per second, and they are really in a very small scale, like a micrometers. And for example, uh, in the in the blood, as the image pr uh, proposed, that they can they have a flow, and this flow is not constant speed. We have a positive flow, and they also because have a. a blood vessels so or close the vessel wall the flow speed is zero and the, in the center is the highest so there's a sheer uh, flow there so they can reorient your body so if you are the uh, this a fantastic watch mini machine a micro micro robot a micro machine micro vehicles you're probably gonna have a very hard time if you are uh, as the same as a car seat like I have, then you will have a hard time. And also those small, uh, small scale micro robots, they are foreign, uh, foreign object. They are not, you know, interesting our body. So they're going to trigger some kind of immune response. So the, let's say microphages can just capture it and, uh, eat it. Basically, they will not, you know, let them just uh, pass by. And also you have blood cells, you have different types of fibers. They can get jammed, they get the stock, they many things can happen to the small vehicle. So so if you think of this, this is really, uh, this is really challenging and uh, on the board when you be in high risk. And also, what's the worst case is they are just get lost, like uh, they lose the connection to the external uh, controller, and then you cannot find it anymore because they're just tiny, like let's say similar with the uh, cell scale. So it's also likely we are not able to find it anymore. And those challenges even get worse if you consider you want to deliver a lot of them into the human body. So for the swarm control, you have many of these vehicles and then uh, they those individual control, but you only have, let's say for magnetic micro robot, you only have one global magnetic field to control everyone. 
And uh, they usually, those machines have uh, diff intrinsic differences due to the fabrication differences. So they will very difficult to control many of them, although there are some very promising progress in the direction, especially in the Chinese University of Hong Kong and the Legion's group, there are many uh, very promising direction for swarm control. But overall, uh, this is still a very, very challenging job. And uh, I'll be really surprised to see someone can you know, can robustly deliver this to the body. And also, if you think of more uh, realistic scenario, if you have some risk that potential get, you know, lost your foreign object, it's very hard to get uh, approval from the regulators either. So because that uh, will be, so those many challenges uh, limiting their future to implement such a fant fantastic voyage into the real human body. So I'm gonna move to the uh, next slide. So uh, so if you think of uh, really like uh, we are at the stage to think of how to implement further into the human body, and I would just use a recent publication that for magnetic uh, guide wire for, uh, for example, stroke uh, treatment, they are, they're usually composed of a couple parts. First, you need to have a magnetic actuation system which provide this global magnetic field which drives this our whatever magnetic micro robot inside the body in this case they are magnetic guide wire but in the previous case they can be a helical shape this micro robots and uh, this is the f first part the second part is the micro robot itself of course we need to inject it somehow or like this through the vein that we can uh, gradually uh, push through the uh, the blood vessel in this interventional uh, uh, surgery in this case to uh, to navigate inside the human body to reach the target position and the third part which is also very important and uh, people rarely talk about is this uh, fluorescent fluoroscope because we need to track where they are you need to image especially in this uh, system structure that uh, this fluoroscope need to be uh, is probably the only uh, available and robust feedback. I think ultrasound is also many people look to look at, it, but the image quality, the resolution, they also play a role there. So in that case, I think still at the current stage, the fluoroscope is the most promising one. And uh, that also means we need to get exposed to the x-ray, maybe a little bit, you know, the dose will be fine for the patient, but for the doctor, that could also be a one concern. And uh, then you you will have an image for where the micro robot are, right? And then you combine as a feedback mechanism, this imaging will provide, let's say, the real time position. So this this uh, feedback from the fluoroscope image is not only the position, also the time is also important. If you can imagine when they're in the artery, which is like flow very very fast speed, then you need to have a very fast tracking as well. Otherwise, you can potentially lose it. So all this. You can see there are all these parts need to work together to have a potential application of this micro robot into the human body. So I just use a very inappropriate analogy to this process, like a deliver, uh, like a, use a drone to deliver a package in the storm day, which you have the wind, you have this, you have the thunder, you have the the rain, and then it's just really, really, really difficult. And especially this in vivo environment, you have all this. Uh, um, blood cells, you have all this immune system response. So you are not doing an easy job in a very, or lab or in a very well-controlled, well-known experiment. This is really uh, challenging because there's so many things is out of our control and it's a very nasty environment. Also with very limited access, we only, let's say right now, the ro robust feedback is the fluoroscope. So uh, so all this poses so many different challenges. So I just make it sound really, really difficult. Uh, but, but if, and also, uh, so all those three aspects, if you understand actuation system, those uh, aspects is uh, when you think of designing the actual micro robots, all these three aspects need to be considered. For example, as I explained, you need to be driven magnetically. That means you need to have magnetic material on the micro robot. Right, so um, I already go to the uh, slide number four. So uh, those magnetic material provide a uh, driving force and torque to uh, for the micro robot to move inside the body. And if you want it to overcome a very strong flow, of course you need to put more magnetic material on it so it can be driven more strongly through the external magnetic field. And the other part is the cargo material. For example, typically there will be a drug or in certain cases it can be magnetic nanoparticle for hypothermia. But 
whatever well we want to do there also could be the, the other materials that we want to carry on that's actually the target material so we want to put enough material for this if not enough material on one single robot then we need to implement many of them right so that's also pay, put challenges and for many cases i think for many applications the drug you need to have a minimum concentration locally even though you're doing a local delivery but you still need you know room to put this cargo or the drugs to on board with the micro robot and the last part, as I say, the third part is about the use X-ray tracking. And then usually we put this X-ray contrast agent onto the micro robot so we can see it more easily through uh, the X-ray. So based also, if you want higher temporal resolution, you also need to put more because then the amount of X-ray uh, you apply is also sufficient to see where they are in the real time. So all these three material is necessary to put a very, very limited space, which is typically a cup as roughly as the same scale of the cells, let's say a cup of hundreds of micrometer or tens of micrometer, they are thinner or smaller than a hair. So those small material need to put all of three and they are, you see, they are kind of, uh, we need to make optimization and have to compromise between those three. So that's why so many of the research paper or uh, many of the public, even uh, very high profile publications, they, they don't tell you this big picture. And what they do is when they talk about this biodegradability or how much cargo they can take, they use uh, this polymer uh, of, let's say, the polymer to fill with the whole, uh, this uh, helical structure, and they coat it with a little bit of magnetic material. So you can carry tons of drug on that, but you will be extremely weak in the magnetic field. So that's how they demonstrate their degradability, including us, the same. And also, when you talk about those uh, micro robots can overcome the blood flow, what they do, they use a pure of almost uh, pure nickel sphere and they coat a thin layer on the outside so of course you're very strong because you're all all the all the volume is used for magnetic material so they're very powerful uh to drive uh, you know external magnetic field but then the drug you actually coat on the surface is very limited for certain applications fine but there are many other applications very limited and it, of course you can imagine that uh, let's say nickel is not really biodegradable so if you think of in the body that is really not uh you know, you can imagine to use that. So usually people make those compromises and when they want to show the strength in one direction, they just do it really well, but they don't really talk about the other direction. And so so I want to propose something different. Uh, you know, we can try to break out uh, this uh, framework to do something a little bit different. And for the robust, uh, so uh, so then you can think of this is uh, if you have mobile de delivery so difficult, can we think of something more robust? Of course. So as uh, most of ad medical application, you want to deliver liquid or extract liquid, you use medical catheter, and those catheter have so many methods to drive. Some of them have internal um, the pull wire, so you can tilt it like in the standard endoscope, or some of them can be magnetically guided. So there are also some works from our group is working on that. So you can use external magnetic field to guide, similar as I showed you previously, to show this magnetic possible guide wire. And if you have this uh, lumen as a medical catheter, as you can imagine, you can just pump whatever drug or anything through the inner lumen, right? So that's really like the most robust method ever. Like uh, blood, let's say, uh, they would not have a direct, because they're just sealed, they're encapsulated. There's nothing can direct interact with this uh, in vivo environment. So, and uh, this is also compatible with the magnetic navigation system. So they're, they're, they're pretty ideal, but this also have a disadvantage, especially consider something small, is um, there's a law called hagen poisson flow. So if you shrinking down the dimension to it at the micrometer level, the drag is so high that the pressure is incredibly, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is prohibitively high that they will not allow you to pump in a very fast speed. So everything will be kind of like, a, it's like pumping like a glue or honey through a very small, uh, like uh, like uh, you, uh, with, you use a straw to drink honey from it, that would just take like forever. So that is the limitation fundamentally. And you can see from the equation, so the pressure drop is uh, inverse proportional to the uh, radius of the tube of four. So this goes pressure, you know, the pressure required to pump the sufficient amount of drug increase very rapidly when you shrink it down. So at small scale, that is not something really 
ideal. So consider all of this um, delivering challenges. We're looking at a nature for some potential solution. And the one of the well-known example is this intra, uh, in, intracellular transport using the uh, microtubule and the canister motor, also, also with the dynamo motor, lets it walk the, all the opposite directions. I think there are a lot of uh, biologists in the, in the audience, so I would just try, I would not explain too much on that. So, uh, and, and then there's some famous video that to, for visualizing this process, I think is really fantastic. This, uh, this kinesin motor has this two domain and they can alternately bond with a microtubule to walk forward. And this is uh, really beautiful to see. And, they, and of course, this process uh, costs energy with ATP, but this is highly conserved and they are applied for almost many cells. In certain cases, for example, in the neural cells, we have the really, really long, uh, and they can also deliver this cargo to the end of synapses, if I'm, you know, I'm doing, I call it correctly, and then they can release this chemical signal to trigger the next neural motion. And this can be like almost as long as half meter. So this must be a really robust transport mechanism along that. And uh, and and uh, and I we want to mimic it. And another way, if you think conceptually different than the medical catheter, is the medical catheter using tube structure to isolate it, whatever inside the tube and outside the tube. But in the cell, because they're so small, I get, of course, microtubule is a tubule. But what they do is they are not transport anything inside the tube, but they transport it outside. So. It's more like uh, I'm climbing a rail or a track and then I'm dragging another thing with me. So I think this idea of something from inside to outside is also very um, you know, inspiring because then I'm thinking, can we just do something for transport from outside instead of inside? And then this lead to us to make this uh, magnetically um, artificial microtubule that we have, we make this art, uh, a fiber using a very standard uh, materials called SU8, is uh, just uh, for, semi uh, for um, micro mechanical systems, uh, very easy to process, well established method. And then we electroplated, there are some magnetic posts inside this fiber. So this fiber has a lot of holes, but then after electroplated, then they are inside. And then if you put anything, let's say, outside as magnetic material close to this uh, artificial microtubule or this uh, synthetic uh, fiber, then uh, this magnetic start, uh, the, the, under a certain magnetic field, then your object will start to interact with this, uh, uh, your, your artificial microtubule fiber. And this magnetic interaction, usually there can be attraction. So in this case, we make them all uh, soft magnetic material, which means their magnetization is completely determined by the external magnetic field. And as you can see, you know, in the figure, basically uh, the rod, which we were just rolling under uh, the external magnetic field, we were using this uh, small, tiny magnets inside the fiber as an anchoring point to to propel forward. So a little bit like a stepping stone. So when, when the the magnetic rod is a micro rod is on this post on on this magnetic post inside the fiber. They are really like stuck because they're really strong magnetic interaction between them, and they can use it to propel forward. So most interestingly, because their magnetization is dynamic, so uh, it's it's not like uh, when I'm walking on the gluey surface that my feet will be glued completely on the ground. Those magnetic is dynamic, so they can be turned off as well. So when there's like oscillating on and off, on and off. So when they are kind of off, which means magnetic field is perpendicular, uh, sorry, uh, perpendicular to this um, uh, nickel plate, they will, the magnetic direction is really small. So those rods can, propel step by step forward. So they also give them the chance to release it similar, very similar to the kinesin motor mechanism. So this kind of step by step wise attraction and the release this kind of uh, motion design, they're really, uh, really like show, uh, give us some quite surprising results uh, for us. For example, uh, they are walking so well, they rarely, so we have to use this almost 99% or almost pure glycerol to test their dynamics because we want to capture what happened if you cannot overcome the drag. Because the, in the water, they just keep, uh, always keep uh, in tra on track with this motion. And they're really like, uh, so they rotate one cycle for every two steps. So basically every time they go half 
uh, rotation cycles. They will go one step at very low speed. And then uh, if you go to slide seven and play the video, you will see they really like in you know, Olympic swimming, then all these micro robots start to move to the right and you see uh, at the different uh, frequency conditions. So for very low speed, of course, this will roll will just like a flip step by step by step follow a perfect you know this half circle trajectory and they move forward but of course as all the micro robot a micro robot if you uh, uh increase the rotating magnetic field speed they will keep it up at a certain level they will start to lose track they will not able to keep the field you know keep your step anymore because the hydrodynamic direction get really dominant they will just slow things down uh, and in this case, we we provide a very good uh, uh, method to uh, to explain roughly, especially from a fundamental point of view, uh, a modeling to explain what is going on there. So there are actually two type of uh, asynchronization here. Uh, one is this lead translational asynchronization, and the other voice is a uh, rotational synchronization. We also provide a, uh, a model to explain how to predict those uh, transition synchronization, and. Uh, and the, the result is those microtubules, if you have this micro rod on the microtubule, this is a spinning motion, they really provide a fast and a robust locomotion. So uh, so by saying it fast, we need some comparison or some benchmark. So we de uh, develop this value, which like a normalized value, we call it Z value. So it's a velocity divided by the frequency and the length. Basically, it tells you how many uh, steps, how many translational motion they go by giving you one certain rotation, how many body length they walk forward, basically. And uh, this really put the result uh, on top of with many other uh, comparisons. For example, uh, many of the micro swimmer, they slip, which is not really a surprise because, uh, for example, it's, it's how can I say, uh, for like surface roller, because there is a like a liquid layer between the micro robot and the surface, they will not like glue on the surface to move forward. They're more like, I'm, as a person, I'm running on the ice. So each step I make it will not be a full step. Instead, they will just be, make me fool a little bit. So if I run really, really fast, like this uh, cartoon movie, um, um, that I may be able to get very fast, but this is highly inefficient. But if you bring this micro robot, this micro roller, especially this rod structure onto the artificial microtubule, the, you, you will significantly increase the speed. So in our case, uh, we roughly about an order of magnitude, about 10 times higher to the other magnetic micro swimmer as a comparison. And we think this is a, a really uh, interesting and very shocking result because um, in this way, if you think of this uh, triangle structure, as we said before, before, if you want to make a micro robot, you need to make a lot more magnetic material, but you make other sacrifices. But now, if you put this on the microtubule, artificial microtubule, you don't have to make those compromises. You just bring your speed to the next level using this. And what is more interesting way is uh, those uh, those microtubules provide a guide because they're constantly attraction force between the micro robot and the artificial microtubule. So they will always get uh, somehow close by. They will not just easily to lose track, even though what we show they lose track, but they are talk about horizontal motion. They will not easily to be just fly uh, by uh, washed away by the blood. So this kind of, and, you, and we also tested um, experiments, which we just use a static field and those uh, micro robots really just get anchored on one of the plate, which is very, very hard to move it. We have to apply insanely high uh, speed of the pure glycerol to wash them away. And uh, and as as I mentioned previously, uh, the ideal case will to be used in the blood, so and the blood is to have the flow. So we need to test them under a more realistic flow condition. So this flow is not just a hydrodynamic drag force, but it also apply a shear force, which they're trying to bend this micro rod as well. So as I, I put in the slide number nine, uh, the micro robot really just rolling uh, on that, even under the very external strong flow. And we measure this flow, uh, flow vocal motion speed and external flow speed under the different uh, a rotating frequency and see how it behave. And we provide a theoretical, if you're interested, you can read the supplemental material. We have the theoretical prediction showing how this external flow influence this locomotion speed. And we also observe something interesting, uh, like uh, they have this like a two stages. Uh, there's some details quite interesting, for, uh, like sleep and the 
uh, it's, it's really fun to see how they cope with the uh, sort of drag and uh, you really feel sometimes this uh, record was like struggling to uh, hold on to this track and uh, they, but unfortunately they're not strong enough they have to be washed away uh, uh, but all these experiments, we are trying to explore the boundary for this uh, because this, there's so many interesting dynamic happening which we did not understand before. So we are really using some extreme uh, condition which is not will be the same in the real body. For example, the the the, the, the glycerol ninety nine percent glycerol is about a thousand times more viscous than uh, than the water. So because we want to capture the really this the full dynamics that's why we use these really extreme cases to see to understand the, this physical system and and then you can and, and if you uh and with the result for this end of the flow condition is really striking because they are very similar to the natural microtubule uh flow dynamics so if you see the slide 10 there are some really pioneering working around the two, uh, around 2000 that is really the single uh they use optic tweezer to measure the force that you can apply to the single kinesis motor walking on the single microtubule. So when the kinesis motor walk, then they use the optic tweezer to apply this optic force to uh, to hold this bead and to see how fast this bead move along with it. So uh, they they have this a uh, famous uh, load versus velocity plot, and they they measure like what is the low uh, the, the 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 force to hold back so the kinesis don't move any more further. And I think and this decay like with a higher load, uh, the lower velocity is almost let's say. Uh, let the linear this decay is very similar for what we observe under the flow. So in that case, they use optic tweezer to apply this load. In our case, we use uh, external flow to apply the load. So um, we also have a, we are now, let's say, it's not like some machine. If you just apply some load over a certain range, they will just crash, right? But in this case, they are kind of gradually slow down into zero speed and then they will just uh, keep us. Uh, but you already have a much improved compared with the local flow speed. Uh, and also in certain cases, for example, this uh, for 0 0.2 hertz, very slow speed, you also see a little bit like a plateau. There's a weak dependence on the for drag uh, load force uh, at this uh, lower external load uh, conditions. And uh, uh, I find this really amazing and striking because uh, this artificial microtubule is used completely different mechanism. We implement magnetic interaction and we are in a very different scale. We are about a micrometer or, so the typical periodicity, if you're, if you're interested, they're they are really just like a 90 micrometer in the, in the periodicity and the width and the, and the height of the microtubule is about four, uh, 80 micrometer times uh, 50 micrometer. So they are slightly thinner than a hair. Well, if your hair is really thin, then maybe it's similar. So they're really like a hair uh, dimension, uh, but in the natural microtubule, they're like the diameter is about 200 nanometer. They're really like 20 nanometer, sorry. They're really like small scale, nanometer scale. But when you measure the dynamics, they're just strikingly similar. So I find the similarities very interesting. Um, and uh, so uh, following this, we also study this kind of swarm local motion behavior because we, when we use small micro rod, this micro rod is the same length as the periodicity. So they're all at the micrometer scale. So we are thinking, can we use this to transport smaller cargo? So we use uh, this uh, magnetic micro spheres, which is really like a polymeric, a polymetric uh, a matrix uh, and they have a, a bit of iron oxide nanoparticles, which is already get approved by the FDA as this is uh, biocompatible materials. And then uh, they, they are very weak in terms of magnetic, uh, mag uh, magnetic interactions. And then uh, we just spread it out uh, 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 and then uh, apply a field. If you play the video, you will see they will start to assemble at around, this, around the microtubule because around this microtubule you have a very strong magnetic field gradient. So all the particles will, will be drive to close to those places. And they are start when they accumulate large enough, they will start to move between one plate to the other. So this is really like a self-assemble a process and a collective transport behavior allow those swarm of micro robots to f move from one place to the other. So you can imagine if you have a really, really tiny particle, they will not move because when they move halfway, they will just pull back under the next cycle. But if you assemble something large enough, so there's a critical local density or you need to assemble to a certain size to allow you to transport from one plate 
to the other. And we also have quantified, uh, roughly quantified what is going on there, even though this is a really hard, complex process to understand. Uh, and this is also, we observe this behavior in nature because in the cells, when sometimes the cells transport a very large cargo, they don't use one kinesin protein motor, they use a couple of them. So it's like a lot of uh, kinesin motor drag the same large cargo at the same time. So, and they find there's a collective behavior. If everyone drag at the same direction, then it's better than the better force because you, you have less of uh, fluidic drag to overcome. You have this hydrodynamic coupling behavior that allows everyone to walk at the same time. So this behavior is very similar to uh, this like a bike rider uh, in Olympics. So the, the, the other bike rider can hide uh, from each other so you can reduce uh, the wind drag because then you know, they ride at a very high speed. In this case, the drag is also very uh, important. So when you uh, hold a line and walk next to each other, then you have a much higher chance to move to the next step. So this is also interesting uh, behavior that we did not expect before the experiment and we find it out. Uh, it's just a very interesting result. And uh, at very end, we just to help other people understand what this could potentially use, we make a very uh, artificial system. This is not very realistic. We did not reuse the real blood. So we make some microfluidic channel using PDMS, uh, or use an SU8 for PDMS microfluidic channel, very standard things. And we try to show this can be inserted into a small channel and we turn on the global field and the, you can see uh, there's a swarm of micro, uh, these particles uh, follow the guide with the artificial microtubule and gradually accumulated at the end. So uh, we, th uh, we think uh, this kind of showing an idea in the target delivery. So basically the process is you, uh, first, of course, you use a microcatheter. And then uh, when you go to the area, which your microcatheter is a little bit too big, they cannot fit into the smaller vessel, then you push through this kind of as a guide a needle or like a small microfiber. And then you pu push through with the help of magnetic field into the target vessel that you want to deliver your drug in. And then you turn on the magnetic field. The, the every drug will just follow the track on this artificial microchip and don't go to the targeted location without losing in the middle. And, th and this idea can really provide this precision delivery to the next uh, uh, next step because um, they are, using this method, you can be more precise. If I don't know what exactly the realistic case the need for this, but let's say if you have a really small tumor, you want to kill it at a very early stage and the artery which feed this small tumor is super tiny, then this could help your way to guide the, the drug that into the targeted position and only harm the tuber, not the other air branches of the blood vessel for the nice uh, vessel cells. And uh, we think this technology really fit into, like what I show here in the slide number 13, the gap between the traditional medical catheter and the micro robots, because micro robot can move, but they cannot overcome some very strong flow, especially in the small artery. And for the medical, medical catheter, they are very robust and very well developed, but they cannot be easily shrinking down to the micrometer scale. So this, we think this artificial microtubule can really bridge the gap that to continue the full coverage, let's say in the future of potential applications. And in that case, you can imagine uh, everyone will like nicely walk on the artificial microtubule without get lost. So in, in a, another way, you can imagine using the fluoroscope, you don't have to uh, like worry that things if things kind of lose track, they will be uh, washed away all the time. You don't really require the feedback signal from individual micro robot position, but you can just rely on, it will roughly walk on the microtubule. And then I just use the image as feedback to showing, oh yeah, things walk nicely without worrying too much. It's, it's not like you have you heavily depend, depend on the feedback signal for control, but in this case, they will just walk as it is. So I guess I already spent quite some time explaining this. Uh, yeah, so if you're more interested, I think maybe we can also upload um, the, the paper if you have more interest in this. So now I think maybe Katerina, um, I can get back to you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer all of them. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation and for explaining to us this uh, really interesting a technology and um, thank you so much 
Yeah, and I know that Armish, he had a couple of questions already in the chat before, so I wanted to give him an opportunity to ask right now. Hey, Armish, um, please. Perfect. Thank you, Katrina. I think some of my questions um, got answered uh, by Richard, but uh, here is my doubt or sort of curiosity. Uh, Perfect. What sort of uh, governing equation describes or determine the flow at such a microtubal level. Uh, do we see parallels? Do we do we know that the hagen poisley equation describes the flow? If not, then are we relying just on the strong magnetic pull? We would create and it would just suck in uh, the particles to the designated location. Uh, and and then my th okay so my third mm -hmm, last part mm -hmm. of the question is that would we have uh, uh, an animal trial at some point of time out of simulation how 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 close are we for a trial like that well this is an excellent question so uh, yeah, um, Amish you you really like expert in the field they are really like uh, you know you ask the perfect question they they are really really good and um, so I can understand you already understand a lot so I can explain more details I guess so. I think uh, the the reason we choose this Hagen Poisson uh, law to per, uh, to describe the flow because we are let's say in this case as you can see we are kind of looking at the vascular application. So if you think the vascular is uh, uh, is the tubular shape, then yes, I would say they will be governed by the Hagen Poisson flow. But you're right, blood is not a Newtonian liquid, which means they are because they have blood vessel sorry blood cells into into it. So they are not that easy or you will be just a parabolic uh, profile inside uh, the blood vessel. They are definitely more complicated to that. I completely agree. And also certain cases, for example, people have this um, uh, also I'm, I'm not really expert in this medical application, but some people say this uh, uh, this uh, uh, aneurysm they are driven by the, some local vertex in the flow. So, which means this vertex vertical flow, not just the, this linear or laminar flow, can be uh, in even in smaller vessels, which is true. But in the heart, of course, they are just keep pumping. They are definitely nothing close to this hagen zone, But that's definitely not the area where we're looking for the potential application for that. But if you think of something really gets small and smaller, especially smaller than the one micrometer for the diameter of the vessel, then it will, I will say, more closer and closer to the Hagen Poisson flow profile, they will close to this parabolic profile. I guess that probably, hopefully, that answer your first question. Um, and the second one, your comment is, is, is uh, really, sorry, could you remind me what is that? Sorry, I literally forgot. Uh, yeah, I, I was trying to understand, are we relying on the strong magnetic pull? Uh, yes, if, yes. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Sorry, I forgot. So in this case, we did not apply or use any magnetic field gradient. And this is a very important point. So that's actually the key point for this. So um, we only apply a uniform magnetic field, which is much easier to apply. So I think you, if, because you already understand, if you at least like the two magnets interact with each other, if you have a very strong magnet, you can also drive any object, magnetic objects with the magnetic gradient field, right? And uh, one of the limitation is this this mechanism scale very bad so similar so you can imagine uh, this is proportional to the local gradient which means uh, as a micro robot let's say i know i will move to the position which has a stronger magnetic uh, great, uh stronger magnetic field right if i'm like i'm free floating so then that really requires the local gradient field. So if as a micro robot, which is let's say about a few, a, a hundreds of micrometer in size or tens of micrometer in size, the field they feel is very small difference. So you need a very, very high local gradient. That's almost impossible in this case, especially if you think of application. Of course, if you're close to the gigantic uh, permanent magnet, the surface have very strong gradient. But uh, if you put in the brain, so like if you uh, uh, for brain or any potential medical application in the human body, uh, you cannot let's say get too close because they are inside the body, right? So it's not cannot that close to a permanent magnet. So that's also limited the potential to use the gradient field to drive this. So instead, in this case, on the micro, artificial microtubule, you see this small, small, small magnets. So this nickel has a very strong gradient locally because they are really, really small. So from the size wise, this anchoring effect, so you can use as a stepping stone to move forward is pretty strong. So if let's say uh, our, in our case, at least with water, it's just 
when we apply a very fast speed, we've never observed this. So, you know, they always anchor on the move perfectly in a way. So we also definitely, of course, our blood is thicker than the water. Uh, we did not really, to be honest, we did not really provide, uh, um, perform any blood related experiments, but uh, we expect it will walk in a similar way, yeah. And the last question for any animal trial, that's a perfect question. Um, that's, uh, we haven't achieved anything like that yet. So I think it will be possible, but uh, the, the devices also need to optimize a little bit. Right now, they are, um, I think we need a little bit of coding on the surfaces for uh, for the mechanical more robust. So it's kind of working now, but sometimes if you pull this too much, they can break as well. So I think that there's something we need to improve uh, on these devices. And uh, another thing is we also, need to think um, what kind of the really the target application for this because sometimes uh, if you have a large tumor you know you don't need this small device to uh, deliver the drug into the tumor you can just uh, use standard catheter uh, but but I, I'm, I'm also trying to work with other collaborators to seeking opportunities for potential some cases which come on to deliver drug into very small vessels then maybe we can consider more realistic animal studies for such applications Awesome, Richard. Best wishes. Just last point. I think uh, it's more of a point. Uh, if you really know where this application is going to be, I think that would help you design the product better because let's say if it's going to get delivered under anesthesia, so mm -hmm. the whole blood vessels, the shape of a normal human body is in a certain shape, right? Mm. Rather than... Yeah. And so, yeah. So I am just thinking about how the external force is going to... Uh, interact with this tubal at a different condition but if you're really specific that okay this is going to get delivered under anesthesia so we know how regular human bodies ah. yeah. so so that's that's basically the area where we can do some simulation so, yeah well yeah that's a fantastic suggestion thank you so much Hamish. yeah thank you so much for those questions and for answering those um uh, Dr. Shah, Dennis, Joyce, Maya, did you have a question? Please flash your microphones and, and go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard, for sharing such a wonderful work with us. So my question is about the, I mean, um, uh, kind of a structure of the swimmers and the possibility of, um, I mean, formation of the microtubular aggregates. And in the same time, when we are thinking about the delivery of the nanoparticles, I, we know that the nanoparticles have a different, I mean, feature, and some of them uh, even more has a potential of self-assembly and uh, causing aggregation somehow. This is one mm -hmm. point. And another part that uh, I was just wondering about the immune cell, which, uh, which you know that when we are talking about the blood vessel and Plasma is a site for the maturation of the immune cells. And somehow it is very important we are using what zone for maturation. And uh, that's why it's a matter of the delivery of the particles or whatever. I was just wondering to know your opinion around this idea. I, I think that's also a fantastic question. Um, so uh, regarding um, regarding the your aggregates, I think that's totally correct. So I think there are many magnetic uh, nanoparticle or something very powerful. So uh, we because uh, as I said, like usually for many, let's say what people imagine the application for this uh, uh, micro robots, then you need to carry both drug and magnetic material on it. So uh, what we used, for example, the one you see in this uh, composite nano composite microparticle actually they very, have a very small amount of magnetic nanoparticle inside even though they use iron oxide which is pretty strong but uh, they're not like the whole volume is it's like i think probably just very few of them the magnet magnetically pretty weak so the reason why they can also walk on it is because the artificial microtubule provide a very strong interaction with them so the magnetic of the artificial microtubule is strong even though we are not really optimizing it when you just use this Electroplated uh, nickel, which is definitely more room. Let's say you can use a uh, nickel cobalt to improve the magnetic property for this artificial mi artificial microtubule. Uh, so there are room to improve for that as well. And as you said, this aggregates is totally. We also try with this. Uh, I think some other 
as they think for the magnetic aggregates, they usually depends on their geometry and also their magnetic property. So, um, so I think um, I I don't know what kind of magnetic nanoparticle you you are talking about or you have in mind. Uh, but uh, definitely, if you use pure iron oxide nanoparticle, for example, they are really small. The aggregate looks quite different. So I think I did some experiments, and sometimes they. Because they also at nanoscale, the the surface property for those nanoparticles is very important. And I, I I can't say for many cases, but I think I remember they kind of self assemble into like a a blob of like a rod shape, which I'm I'm not even sure why. And they kind of can walk on that. And uh, it's not like all. And they also have different type of assembly. And the reason why we choose this specific uh, microparticle is because also uh, there's no, let's say, there are particle-particle coupling between them because that would make the, uh, the prediction or the assembly much harder to predict and uh, to have overall view of what is going on there. For example, we also try with the neodymium ion boron uh, microparticle, which is similar size as we show it here. And because neodymium ion boron has a high coercivity, so they have a uh, they, they kind of, you know, each magnetic power have their their magnetization, have their own preferred or already pre-magnetized direction. So they just form their own direction. They don't really uh, form this nice, uh, similar size uh, blob of particle to move forward, rather than they can become a huge blob and sometimes they just a field. So they're highly irregular. So I guess in the, the case we want to show the small locomotion, uh, we just show this because they are nicely, you can totally see they have an effective area and they, they are assembled roughly similar size of blobs depend on, of course, depend on local uh, density, but they are moving uh, quite nicely. Uh, yeah, so that's, sorry, could you repeat your second question? Yeah, I mean, for that example, as you just mentioned, we can just get yeah. the amphiphilic molecules, for example, and we can just think about the branch type of that. The second question was about the maturation of the, oh, the immune, immune cell. cell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know much, sorry, uh, about that. But you are right. I think at least for the microphages, some other uh, immu immune cell will definitely respond to this foreign particle. So I I will not be surprised if you just say if you place there for a while, they will less uh, or they could encounter some kind of microphage there, and the microphage trying to eat it up with this uh, micro, uh, with the uh, with the magnetic particle on the artificial microtubule, let's say, well, you are transporting it. But I think there are some interesting works um, from not from our group, but from other groups, they, they actually try to to modify this microphages through the magnetic part, magnetic particle, because once they just take it in, right, they decorate the surface with something. When they take it in, then this microphages is getting responsive to magnetic field, and they want to drive it to do something, let's say, to treat, I think, um, yeah, treat some like brain tumor, for example. And uh, and I think that's also maybe potentially interesting because I'm pretty sure if you give the microphages enough material, it will walk on this microtubule for sure because this is like also, it's just anything close by magnetic, they will get attracted on it and just walk along it. Thank you so much. This is also a wonderful question. Shall I ask a quick question? Oh, please. Go, go for it, Joyce. Okay, well, I'm afraid I missed quite a bit of it, but um, so I'll just ask kind of a general question. Um, what is your, um, your wildest hope as to what uh, diseases it might be used in? Thanks, I'm done. Wow, that's a, that's a really difficult question, uh, Joyce. Um, I think... I don't know. I think I'm still in the exploration stage. It's very hard to to guess. So, uh, as as I think, as you can see, um, this I think they're mostly we do this work because of fundamental interest. But uh, the artificial microtubule can provide a way uh, either to somewhere which is very hard to access before, or some drug which have a very bad side effect. So I think. For example, if you, I just imagine it, if you have a, let's say a micro stroke, like those blood, a brain blood vessel is so tiny that the traditional method cannot go into it. Then, for example, I think there's a well-known TPA as a, uh, as a drug to dissolve this local uh, blood clots 
in the stroke case, stroke cases, uh, because they also have a very strong side effects. So of course, you just want to release in the where the stroke happens. And, uh, and I think in that case, if you have a micro stroke in a small area, then maybe this can be as a application case they can deliver or um, somewhere, I, I think also see a case which they also use a very small micro catheter because in the blood vessels to supply the eyes also very, very tiny. So they also make a very, very tiny specific micro catheter to deliver this drug into the eye, um, the, the artery which supply the blood to the eye, right? So if you release it there, the drug is not going anywhere else, but they just follow the bloodstream and uh, just uh, go to the eye area. They will not have side effect to many other places. So I would say they will not, I would not see a very, um, widespread, let's say, they can be used for many. Ex they are not really trying to solve anything existing uh, method. They are more like a futuristic that we want to deliver something very uh, small vessels or uh, or you know a release a drug which is a very strong side effect. You just want to go there, not any not anywhere else. So I think that could be the most potential to have a breakthrough, I guess. Sorry, I'm really not on the education side. This okay, my best guess. that's all right. <laughs> uh, that was a very good answer. Very interesting and very exciting developments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. Thank you, Richard, for this amazing presentation. I was very uh, intrigued by this visual of the um, fluoroscope and the x-ray on the C-arm. Wow. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That, that's a very cool visualization. I've never seen it like this. We have had some other um, presenters on nanobots and this sort of technology. And I was curious about the durability of either uh, the microtubules or the nanobots that you've looked at and the degradation of um, the, this type of technology, like the time scale of when it becomes no longer a viable machine so you're talking about like the whole life cycle for this nanobots, right? Yeah. Or okay, maybe per okay. maybe per uh, per microtubule, right? Like so, you got the different microtubules. You're gonna insert them at different times into the body, right? So, like, yeah. How long does one microtubule last? Where it'll allow the you know the walking on the, the through through the like electric magnetic function. <laughs> Okay, so I would say the microtubule, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll consider this both part from uh, the microtubule, they are highly repeatable. So you, it's not like, uh, so the issue with it is this magnetic material may get gradually oxidized, but the speed is really, really slow in water or in the air. So at least what for me, I, you, I've been using one microtubule because I kind of glue it on the chip so I can just, you know, perform something easily. Uh, it's been a couple of months and I don't see obvious a very significant, uh, you know, performance decay, something like that. So I would say for as many stable magnetic material, or you can do a surface coating to prevent the potential oxidation, then it can last for pretty long. Of course, mechanical wise, they are also could be brittle. So we are also thinking maybe do a little bit coating like this optic uh, fiber. So if you coat the surface with something elastic, then they will, even though you have cracks, they will not propagate and you, you know, they will not break or anything. They will, or you can easily retract it back. So I would say the microtubule should have expect similar as this standard medical catheter or potentially can be something like that. Um, and as you can see, after this delivery or imagine treatment, then we just retract it back, so they will, we will not leave it there. So we don't—they don't have to be biodegradable. Uh, um, and in terms of nanobots, definitely there. Are, if you think of you deliver swarm of them and leave it there, definitely the whole life cycle becomes super important because they will need to be biodegradable over time. And I think, uh, which is the, I think the only, there are many people use iron oxide, but I think the iron oxide is very small. I think like a, 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 about five to ten nanometer size. So they are not uh, a lot. So it's, it's and also if you can make it like iron, they are also potentially biodegradable, but. Um, the, this, the particle, not just the material, the format, this particle size also plays an important role here because if you use something smaller than a five micro, five nanometer, uh, you can, uh, um, you know, they can pass through the kidney and they, they can be accumulated in the urine. So you can easily get rid of the body. But if they get really large size, then I guess in the end, they will, uh, they will be degraded by, I guess, microphages, something they're going to eat it and then 
gradually to degrade it. But that is not a very ideal path. So I think people are still working on that. At least you cannot just administer uh, put a lot of such microparticles into the human body and expect they will be all be fine. I think there will be a, a maximum um, a load that that will be the safe load allowed to put on it. So that's why we think, for example, uh, this nickel rod that we show in the paper, it may be not very ideal for drug delivery because they are full of metal, right? Uh, but in certain cases, uh, it depends. Some people, sometimes the treatment want to be, uh, you want to block, let's say, a cancer cell, like you block the vessel, the, the blood supply to a certain tumor, then, you know, well, that will be fine. Like as long as the resurface cause something to protect it, and then it can stop the blood flow and then the tumor will gradually shrink. That could be, this kind of, um, to trigger the thrombosis, I think it will be something potentially useful. But for the others, which like say, I think they're more, maybe more pros promising that we show later with the small composite, poly mostly polymer uh, particles, which they only have a few nanoparticles inside, but the most of the body, we can use, let's say that biodegradable hydrogel as the main particle material, and we can just load drug into it. That will be, let's say more, uh, more promising, but of course, then that's will slightly weak. So that's why we need to help with the microtubule. Along the same line, Richard, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Along the same line, so you're thinking, imagine that it is, it is reusable and recyclable, and you can recover it just as easy as when you deliver it. So my question is regarding to the cargo. Mm. So the cargo size varies, right? So you can have a smaller cargo, a big cargo depends on the purpose. Exactly. So if you want to deliver to a larger area, so what makes you think, what makes you, so sorry, recheck. What would be a good location, localization specific specification um, uh, cargo you, can, you need to carry on, core localized, right? Because your drug, and then you need it to be delivered. What kind of things are you thinking with? Uh, let me put it in different. Hold up just a second. Mm -hmm. You know how, like, if you want to deliver to the brain, yeah. let's say, you, have, you said you, you mentioned a stroke. So you want a specific region, basal region of the brain, brain stem. Mm -hmm. So are there any ready target molecules or cues you already Tested, um, coupled we did not, with your microtube. Not with, really tested okay. any, uh, any. Yeah, this not okay. the, still uh, not really drug tested yet. But I think you're right. I think one thing at least the field right now is considering is, is this TPA. I'm not really a drug person, but I what, what I heard, what I have very little knowledge on that. But what I heard that this this is a drug is a it's a very effective drug when people have stroke. So if you deliver an or if you just in, uh, inject into the bloodstream, then they will can dissolve many uh, from Thrombosis in the or the, the you know the blood clots that block the vessel, so they can really uh, very effective to treat the stroke. But the reason why the doctor don't use it much because they have a very strong side effect; they're completing elsewhere. So that's kind of like a you know double double uh, edge sword. So you can you it's not like a, a safe drug to use. So many doctor really concerns a lot when they they're using it. So some cases they think the risk is higher than the benefit. They just don't use it. So. But if you think of you can deliver locally, the things could change, right? Because you just give the area which had the uh, blood uh, blood clots or the thrombosis, and then you can dissolve locally. Then you can have much higher confidence to use a slightly higher amount, right? Then that give you advantage for this targeted or very localized drug delivery. So I think that could be uh, that at least from the story point of view, make a lot of sense to do this. That's uh, but I have a very limited knowledge on that. All right, can I jump in and ask a couple questions? Oh, absolutely. All right, well, thank you for this presentation, doctor. And uh, this is fascinating stuff, right? So I get a, just want to get a couple little quick clarification. I just, because I just jumped in in the kind of like latter part and I've been looking at the PDF here. Mm -hmm. So on, I guess, slide number, where's that at? Um, let me find it, I'm looking on my little phone here. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it seems like, okay, it goes, I get it, it goes through the tube, mm -hmm. right? It goes through the tube, and then it's going to get to the uh, little magnetic delivery function, yes. right? So does it, does it do the delivery, what I'm trying to understand, where is that slide? Let me see. What I'm trying to understand, I guess, is, um, 
Yeah, here we go. Okay, it's the second to last slide, yes. I guess, number 13. Exactly. The medical, it says medical catheter to AMT to microbot, yeah. right? Does that mean, that, so I see the, uh, so the, t so the medical uh, um, catheter is the medical catheter. And then is that, that micro, the, the, the magnetic railway that it moves down, yes. right? That the cargo moves down. Is that all the way back to the beginning where it's inserted? Or is that like the uh, cargo goes floating down a tube and then it, then the, the track is towards the end and then they all line up on the track and go down? Or is that that track, that magnetic track all the way back to the very beginning? Um, they, uh, of the catheter. Yeah, so the track should be connected to the catheter because the track uh, is like a fiber. So the way we implement this, they, I think uh, they should go through this uh, uh, micro catheter because you know we already well already known that this catheter or uh, let's say the smallest catheter we can buy available on the market, they can already work really well, right? So there are a lot of doctors have experience with it. So the question is about how you can go deeper into the microvascular structure. Can you be more precise? In in certain uh, need exactly and that's yeah. how let's say you can just push through like a really small very thin fiber uh this artificial microtubule through this micro catheter and then you start to uh, rotate the magnetic field and then any magnetic drop let's say close to the trail will just walk on it and then just robustly follow the lead of the this track and then into this uh, target position and then when you go to the target position maybe uh let's say really really tiny vessel then the, the the flow is almost negligible or really, really uh, flow, low speed, and then the drug can release it there and maybe can finish the maybe a uh, last few millimeters. And, and to be honest, I think maybe you can just randomly release it. That's also be fine. That's, I guess. Yeah. So it, it looks like, it's, so I guess my question is is that track running the full length of the catheter, or is it? just at the end where you know like the, the 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 cargo goes down and then they jump on the track and it's almost like a little tongue or you just stick it out you yeah, know you get to exactly. the you push the tube as far as you can go and then you then you like it's almost like a little tongue or or, or a little uh, I, I will butterfly imagine then, that then this sticks out i will imagine that way so yeah for, but for the for the real application you this uh this town as you said like this artificial microtubule they will be connected to i don't know let's say we can make a wire on the back let's say metallic wire or nitinal wire uh, which is we know very stable and uh, uh, uh stiff and then they also sorry they're also flexible can follow the, the trajectory but uh, we don't have to make all the way back, let's say, uh, let's say two meter long artificial microtubule, right? That could be, uh, yeah, yeah. that's how I feel. Exactly. Yeah. You don't need to, you just need to get the cargo down to the end and then you just need a little small space. Uh, so you exactly. Know, let the, you know, ride around the track, right? I, yeah. I have a, so then the next, my, I have hold a, on, hold on, let me, let me, Amish, can I finish? Let me, have, let me go over this. Hold on a second. Right. So then, um, okay. So then the next, uh, so I understand that. Then the next question I have is around power consumption is that, so the battery, the the magnetic um, uh, movement down, you're doing that with, a, I guess, an external source Absolutely. to charge it up and push it down, right? Yeah. And then what's the what's the what's the power needs? Is it low power or higher power? Like what's power power needs for this? Uh, it's uh, this is a perfect good question. The power it depends on what kind of magnetic system you use. For example, if you use the one I think I draw there for. Uh, maybe the slide number three, do you use a robotic arm to hold a magnet at the, at the end? And then your power will be the robotic arm, whatever you, you consume to rotate yeah. the magnet. But in other cases, for example, use electromagnetic system, which means you pump a lot of current into the coils to drive this. And that's much higher power, let's say for in the medical or clinical setup, that could be a kilowatts or even higher. I think, I think we use 40 kilowatts, something like that. It's pretty high, but the advantage for such systems, yeah, is you can, yeah, you can just turn, all the, turn off the field, which is much, let's say, much safer than the robotic arm in a clinical environment because those magnets, they're, they're pretty strong, but not as dangerous as the MRI magnet. This thing will get, you know, attracted to it. And I don't know how that will work out in a clinical setup, but uh, there are different, they are different system and then different had advantages. Uh, you know, they all have their advantage and disadvantages. Uh, yeah, but they are not like insanely high power. So I think in a clinical setup, those kind of power should be acceptable level in a way. Okay, so the next question I have is that length, the, uh, um... What is the, that little track they're moving down, right? The little magnetic track. Yeah. What is the dimensions of just that track? Like, you know, like in millimeters, let's say like one one thousand or like what's, what's, or one one hundred. I don't so know. What's the, uh, what is, 
uh, they are exactly roughly the size of the hair. So they are 50 micrometer in width and I think uh, 80 micrometer in height. So they are roughly like the hair, but they can be, I think our sample made, let's say three or two, two or three centimeter long. So this length is very long, but uh, they are the width and the height is very, very thin. So they are exactly like a hair. So, so the width, okay, the width and height is exactly like a hair, including the uh, cargo uh, floating on, you know, moving on top of it, or not including the cargo? No, not including the cargo. But the cargo is roughly okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay, this is fascinating stuff. Okay, let me tell you why. All right. Wow. This is really cool stuff you got. Right. It's not just for medical, bro. Okay. You could probably okay. But this is. I've been looking around and trying to find stuff for a while. I'd like to talk to you about using utilizing this technology in the augmented reality world. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, yeah, and not not and not necessarily through the body, but externally, not not inside the body, right? So because, all right, so here, um, I don't mind mentioning it. this needs to come out to the world and hopefully, and it needs to be open source. This piece of information has to be open source, parts, right? With, because in the augmented reality world, needs to be this piece is what unlocks the whole augmented reality world. Okay, right now in AR, right? Mm -hmm. um, imagine you have AR glasses on, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's a lot better stuff than 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 Apple and other guys stuff. Uh, let me give you some links to look at and then we can talk later. So if you look at immacula.io, E-M-A-C-U-L-A.io, immacula.io, you'll see the, they, they have what I believe to be the, uh, the lead in um, AR uh, holographic uh, mm -hmm, display mm -hmm. technology, which is the uh, lens and uh, filter. So they have a little two minute, three minute video. So that's Immacula, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So I know the CEO there is my friend, right? And then um, there's also uh, two other platforms that can, you know, potentially be in it. We're talking about integrating, which is uh, um, uh, sensoryx.com. That's, that's, that's the, 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 the CEO there, Dr. Ralph is a friend of mine. That's who we want to get on a call with um, on, on figuring out your tech and his stuff. So he's got glove technology for the augmented reality world and he's got sensors on it. So yeah, sensoryx.com. Mm -hmm. and, and he's got the best gloves for the AR world, right? Wow. And the last one's going to be that you want to look at is, uh, yeah, exactly. Badass stuff, right? Virtu Virtuix, uh, and I'm, I'm invested into Virtuix, um, is another friend that, of mine that actually developed locomotion in the AR VR world. So that's the Virtuix Omni. And so if you went and looked in YouTube, Virtuix Omni, you know, it's freaking mind blowing, cool stuff. Same thing with Sensory X, right? Uh -huh. Now, I mentioned this because here's, here's the deal, right? If you got your glasses on and you have a hologram in front of you, let's say you're, you know, you're, you're standing and then you have a hologram of a door right in front of mm -hmm. you. The door has a doorknob on it, okay? You go with your gloves, right? To go reach in and turn the door, right? You're gonna grab the door handle, it's a knob and you're going to twist it, rotate it, right? To open it. Now, the problem in the AR world right now that exists is to create the resistance. If you go grab it right now, it's just like, you know, it's okay. Are you around it? Your fingers can kind of go through it. It's not, it's not, it's not fluid, right? And it's not like you don't have any resistance. You don't feel like it's a doorknob because there's no resistance back to stop your hands from squeezing in, your fingers from squeezing in. Yeah. So AR needs to take the physics of the real world of basically creating joint, locking the joints, okay, to, mim to mimic resistance in the real world into the AR world, all right? Yeah. And in order to do that, what I had, you know, what I thought about was utilizing, um, I was like, okay, you gotta got have a polymer. So imagine a glove, and then there's like a thin layer all around the external part of the glove. In there, you have uh, uh, running, let's just use one finger at a time, it's be easier, right? So you got your index finger, and let's say the inside of the finger where the palm is, and you have a strip, right? A strip running from the top of the finger down to the bottom of the finger. You got three joints there, okay? Mm -hmm. If you had a strip there on the, the, the bottom side and top side, and you had a polymer in there that you can adjust the viscosity level from stiffness to you know soft or liquid, right? At different varying degrees, at let's say every like, uh, two millimeter point even, or three millimeter point, or every millimeter point, like a little sack, you can adjust the viscosity level. A polymer that can be electro magnet, like electronically charged, mm -hmm. right, um, to, to do that. But you could do electromagnetics, right? So when I looked into this, the solution that we kind of, we're all playing around with is ferromagnetic fluids. Because hmm. then you can have the magnetic charge at the top and bottom and then create the, you know, various viscosity levels, right? right? 
but then I'm so I'm looking at yours and it's very similar stuff, right? If you're able to kind of control the magnetic field and you're mo- I'm, I imagine the cargo as you're moving it down and that's a very interesting way you're doing it. So when I was looking at that, I was like, okay, that's efficient because then you could still use that where they where and have just one. You, you basically created instead of having two strips where you need a strip at the bottom and a strip at the top and a magnetic, you know, uh, you know, you activate positive negative top and bottom to move stuff through mm-hmm. you just do it you're, you're doing i see how you're doing it it's, it's it's very clever so it's it's more efficient right to where and you're and it's less space too right so the the cargo is moving along there right now in the catheter though right think of the catheter uh, uh format right mm-hmm. in that catheter if you had a um you know you had that, that that bottom layer tube and then you had the ferromagnetic fluid and it basically just charges up and creates stiffness and you can direct that to specific points on, on in the on the on the finger, you know, through a bunch of. And I don't know exactly how it would be done, you know, it, rather than having a bunch of little wires going all the way down every millimeter, it'd be nice if you can basically activate somehow on the track. Like, let's just activate. You know, if the, if the track has a hundred points on there, mm-hmm. right? Position one, two, three, four, five. If you can, from the uh, from some other point, activate just you know. Let's activate um, sections, you know, 25 to 30 to be stiff, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 20, uh, uh, 35 to 45 to be medium, right? Mm-hmm, and if you mm-hmm. can do that, now we have basically cracked the biggest problem in AR right now, right? And doing it now, the issue with utilizing ferromagnetic fluids yeah. is, and this, tech, this, this approach is the power consumption that would be required to basically have that much um because uh, you have the whole body, right? And, or at least the gloves, right? The gloves on the front yeah, and back side to basically power, start. Exactly, right? So bringing that, like, what would, bring that power down, right? But even then, gamers and, 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 I mean, the medical professionals, doctors, the use for this is so vast that even if there's higher power consumption uh, in the beginning, that's okay. People will still jump on this, right? Um, mm. And then maybe over time, you can get more efficient. Or I think you right? mentioned like, a very would be... interesting uh, uh, question. I, I think, uh, I think I, uh, yeah, if I understand correctly, you're talking about the stif- uh, variable stiffness control. Basically, some people use different you know, material and you're considering using ferrofluid as a variable stiffness control. Uh, there actually is a good idea because there's, that's how the car damper, many of them are because you know, the magnetic alignment can drastically change the viscosity. You know, they can give you this kind of resistance as you want. I, I think it's quite, you know, it's uh, not a bad idea for this AR uh, let's say gloves to give you this um, you know the right touch or the sensation i think it's uh, it's right but as you said like um i think there are two uh you probably two issue with it but one as you already mentioned the power is not uh, not gonna be small right so you need a lot of coils probably or other method to drive it and the other is the magnetically uh sometimes it can be local but for our case you can see they are a kind of global magnetic field because you, it's not like uh, the other actuator magnetic if you turn on the global field everyone will suffer you know it's kind of you know uh, breathe in or emerge in this magnetic field everyone will be and uh, everyone will feel the same it's not like i just turn on you 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 feel the field and the, the other place don't so that's not uh i think that's just not really the magnetic system works so they have to usually uh in our case you have a, always a generating a large magnetic field in the workspace and then everything will govern by the magnetic interaction inside a system. So I think uh, I think what you're looking at should be something not because if you have an AR assumption, you will not you know you really want to need a large magnetic setup to drive this, which will be acceptable in the clinical setup. But for this kind of I think consumer electronics, it should be something I don't know like uh, then you need as you said you need to think of. Uh, I don't know how this be some local interactions between the mag- your ferrofluid and what kind of the magnetic interaction, the strong, strongly magnetic uh, component other than the ferrofluid inside the gloves. And then they will give you the strong interaction which can provide this your this touch or the, the drag as you is that something you're considering? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you we're going down the right track yeah. there, right? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, so do I. Yeah, so the, so, 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 it like with but with this, with this application, I, I understand that you guys are using the external source because you're inside, right? But if you're already external, if you're already outside, right? You can um you you can charge, like having an external third uh, apparatus to charge the track, 
would not be ideal. It'd have to be somehow charged through the track itself, right? Like you can go in and track, you know. That will be amazing. amazing. I think you are talking about something that will be really cool because if that can be realized, as you yeah. said, you don't need external setup. That would be great. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. So let's do this, okay? Right, if you want. Uh, like follow me and then I'll send, I sent you a message, I think, right? Absolutely. And then if you have WhatsApp, I can, I could, I could, we could jump on a call. I'll get, I'll get Rolf on the phone, the CEO of the uh, Sensory X, because we're, like we're already working on this stuff. And then um, we could jump on and just brainstorm and see if there's a, a opportunity here to basically um, utilize your tech approach, the approach you're doing, you know, with little modifications for the, uh, for the AR gloves. I think we, we were thinking, you know, not the AR glove, but we were thinking solving something like you mentioned, you know, can we, uh, how, uh, you know, because right now the magnetic interaction, as you said, driven by the external setup and they are, let's say they will be pretty expensive. They will not be something really cheap, uh, but can we use something, let's say locally to switch the magnetization? I think they are at a nanometer scale. So you can use it like current to swap the magnetization, nanomagnets yes, yes, by yes, exactly. in orbit exactly. coupling. That exists there, but they're not able to scale up because they are, you know, I'm talking about, you know, a few nanometer scale, like a hundred nanometer. But, you know, let's say this medical setup or many of the applications, let's say the gloves increase, they're much larger. And then that is something a little bit missing in the, in, in the range. And I think the existing or the technology will be used coils. And the coils, I can imagine, they are large, they're heavy, they, are, they have disadvantages. So that's also people looking into, I think, how we can couple magnetic and electric material and the metal scale or something for various kind of application to provide the feedback. I think maybe you, you should look into, I think there's a, a quite interesting paper by John Rogers. They use this a vibration to provide the sense of touch with a different tuning frequency by John Rogers uh, using the very small permanent magnet and the coils. And uh, and then they can provide this, uh, as you said, this is sensory feedback, but not the ferrofluid or the resistance, but the other type of sensory feedback, like the touch feedback, using a high vibrating signal to mimic or to simulate how we feel from the surface. If that's something you'll be interested, but absolutely, you know, I'm, we'll be if I follow following question, I'm very happy to discuss with you for any brainstorming. Yeah, if you are interested in this. Yeah, topic, yeah. You know. So I so I think let me see let me double check I think I sent you a message there. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll do it right now. So I'm not thinking, so if you just kind of send me your number and then we could jump on a I'll, I'll do a little WhatsApp group with the CEO and then we'll could ju jump on a you know find a little time there because this will be a fun it'll just be a fun call Absolutely. to get on. Dude. Absolutely. Just, I'd love to. Yeah, I think we also missed yeah. one of our Amish question for previously. Yeah. Okay. No, that's okay. Uh, so, but Richard, uh, my question was when Meyer was asking, right? So, how this track's gonna, what would be the initial starting point of this track? And you, you said that okay, there would be the point where the micro cathedral ends. Mm -hmm. From there, you're gonna, right? So, I think there are a couple of design issue with that because in that case, you're gonna be driving or guiding or controlling that magnetic track via cathedral but not directly but if you have that track going really up to the beginning of where you insert it you would have the direct control of that track so that would actually increase your problem it's like controlling another pipe with a different pipe mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. i just want to put this out that's that's if uh, if the track somehow you might have to create a different cathedral slot itself which can accommodate this uh, track and go up to the places where the cathedral can go and then from there it extends because it's all about guiding and navigating that thing how you are uh, how are you going to do that because putting the fluid through the track is one problem but guiding that is also another problem mm -hmm. yeah so that's just my two cents and that's where i was trying to come in and say okay i think that's a, that's a problematic decision. i i completely agree i think you're really pointing uh this like uh, if you consider as you said like this process so gui the guidance with the catheter and the guidance with this uh this track they're both is a problem and uh, uh but but they're kind of like the other aspect in this application that people are looking for how to this guide why you they, they are some already established the guide why even magnetically guided the catheter so the catheter they also sometimes they have this pull wire you can just pull and the tip just tilt and then 
you can use or uh, multiple tools for this uh, interventional surgery. So I think, uh, of course, with their magnetic ones, maybe it was slightly easier for doctor to operate it. But even though that's a st- uh, I think a state of the art, they're using this guide wire, op- you know, repeatedly uh, swapping the guide wire and the catheter to go to the right position. Sorry, the right location, and that's that's kind of the yeah. That's how I think the standard practice for interventional surgery. And I think you also mentioned another important aspect is how this interaction between this uh, uh this fiber this track this fiber and this uh, catheter, right? And I think there also could be some opportunities there. I would say if they really find some interesting application uh, for a specific uh, location we just want to go, and you know we can even customize the catheter for that, and the microtubule can even be part of the catheter, like they can be merging to one object if that is a good idea. But I just I don't really know, so this really depends on the application case. I would say. Yep. Yep. But thank you so much for those comments. Yeah, thank you so much for this amazing discussion and that we got maybe a collaboration going on. For yeah, the sounds really, really, really stimulating. Actually, no, he... yeah. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll ask him. I'll, I'll ask uh, Dr. Rolf and see how how willing he is to come on Clubhouse to talk about Sensory X and 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 your tech. Like, if we had a joint session, right, with you and uh, Dr. Rolf, right. Um, mm-hmm that would be pretty interesting right like and and, and he's you know i mean he, he's he's already commercialized and in there and like oh got all types of ip and whatever but this piece here i think it'd be kind of nice to uh to jump in and and and, and, and like brainstorm about it in, in a room um or or at least or we could start on the call to see what you know set that call up but this is uh i just want to like i'm just so, I, I'm telling you, man, I'm super excited because this guy is a genius, man. Like what he's done over there and the speed at which he moves and he just didn't do the gloves. He did this external sensors. He's creating so much stuff in the in the AR world at blazing. It, like this dude will come up with a prototype a, with hardware in like a week, you know, in a few days. It's incredible what what, what, what his capabilities are over there. Um, I know he's in Europe. I think it's in, he's in Switzerland. Um, but um uh, because Richard, he's in Constance, Germany, so it's right next door. Yeah, right next door. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I, I don't know if you need help setting things up um, or, you know, absolutely, uh, yeah. for Clubhouse. But, sure, uh, sure. I'll, I'll ask him. I'll ask him if he'll come on here. I don't know that, you know, he's a little shy, right? But I'll see if he can, if he can, uh, um, I think he will. I think he'll come on, right? I can convince him to come on, right? So um, that, that, that would be, that, yeah, we can talk about it, set it up. It'll be kind of fun, you know? Sure. So, that's me. Yep, yep. I'm always happy when there are collaborations starting and projects yeah, starting. Yeah, yeah, then also time. welcome. Yeah, definitely. No, no, I mean, this, look, this thing is like the biggest thing in AR, like the cracking this problem, right? Would This is what's needed to unlock the AR world right now. Yeah, you know? I agree. To it's like really challenging for the haptic feedback, yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's not, and see, everybody calls it haptic feedback, but it's not haptic feedback. Oh. It's resistance, right? It's a yeah. different, it's a different thing. Cause it like, okay, for example, right. There's this, um, actually there's another company called haptics, H A P T I X, right. Haptics. They created this glove. They got like 20 million in funding and all this cool shit and whatever. But you know what, when you go put it on, mm-hmm. it has 16 tubes coming into the glove. It has an air compressor outside. Okay. I see. Right. I see. So, yeah. So it's like, I put it on. It's like feel this. It feels like a, like a little. You're looking at a spider, and it feels like it's it's walking on your hand. I was like, okay, that's cool, uh, right? But it's not. It's like this is not gonna work, dude. Nobody's gonna walk. Like people want to walk around externally in the world in the AR uh, uh, world, just walk around and have their gloves on and have their AR uh, glasses on, right? And um, the little headpiece and and interact. They don't want to have some lugging behind them a. Uh, air compressor for their gloves and the same thing with the with the with the glasses and you know like you know whether it's microsoft or all the other guys right now they get you got to put a big old box on your head right this is not going to work that's not going to be the winning product so immacula has the the, the the winning um uh glass tech and, and and they already did like a four million dollar deal with darpa now they're already uh, they're going through fda approval right now 
um, for the for the contact lens tech because it's also for medical use. And these things have a crazy like uh, um, Steve Wiley is the CEO there. I talked to him. One of the things that when I when I had a session with him that he he disclosed to me was they have thirty. They have they have they have thirty x zoom. I mean, imagine being able to walk around, dude, and like look at something and have thirty x zoom. That's crazy. That's insane. That's what that that's what exists right now, right? Wow. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, I think also for prosthetics, it would be really cool because really good prosthetics should have a really good sensory feedback, uh, which can actually even help patients with getting in. Uh, mobility and sensory input over um, their actual body, like um, Miguel Nicolelis and so showed this. So mm -hmm. the better that would also work for like prosthetics, that would be also amazing, also for recovery. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you're right. I yeah. think this is a force or the resistance generation or there's a force generation for the haptic feedback. If something can be done very well, that's really like a they're really like a game changing exactly not just for like AR, there can be many, many applications out there actually. Yeah, for example, in the medical use, like you could even like work out your muscles or something. If you have a full suit on all over the place and it's got these little areas that you could add resistance, so you could basically stiffen an area and release it, stiffen it, kind of creating a pulsing movement, right? Yeah. If you need to like, you know, I mean, I mean, technically speaking, I mean, we could probably replace the straight jacket with this thing, right? I mean, you know, somebody acts up, good, they get locked up. You know, you're in a fight, hit the button, you can't move anymore, you know? To solve the yeah, problem. Yeah, that's in, really in like prison. a science You know what I'm saying? Science fiction come true, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is this is kind of what I do, man. My thing is, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I float at the thirty thousand foot level and come down to like the ten thousand foot level and the technology. I kind of translate between the technologists and everybody else, right? You know. Yeah, but but so I, I think you get like, at, least, at least one thing. I, I think this is a, a your direction is totally right. I think the magnetic could have some advantage at the small scale, like um, especially you can control with electronic wire somehow. That's this. There are there's certain advantage. Let's say it's like when we play to a magnet, their interaction very strong. So for this. The small, or let's say you wouldn't have a size limitation, like, you know, if you put on the glove or some other thing variable, you, you cannot, let's say, as you say, like a pump's in because then you cannot drag around this pneumatic pump behind you for those applications. If it's something portable and uh, provides strong this uh, force or this kind of interaction with, especially the human body, then uh, actually magnetic system is one direction to look at. Uh, there are definitely potentials in there. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. You know. So I also sent you my LinkedIn uh, in the message. You could send me like a request over there and check cool. me out there. And then, you know, I'll send you Rolf's. Uh, uh, I could probably just do a group chat on LinkedIn between me and Rolf to get that going, you know. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it'll be kind of fun to go from there because, you know, I, I, I really want I really want to enter the AR world as fast as possible. <laughs> so like my selfish incentive is not even money. It's like, can we just get this done so I can put these on and like we now have the AR world like this is what's needed and if we make it happen we just opened up the AR world you know that's what's waiting that's this is the last piece that's needed wow that would you know? be amazing yeah, yeah great thank you so much mayor uh this was um such an amazing room uh I don't know if you guys want to keep chatting or because it's almost two hours are up I didn't want to take you know more time of I'm at it, but it's getting late for you too. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, I'm looking forward for, you know, to hear, keep me updated how things work out. I'm, I'm happy about that. And um, yeah, feel always free or welcome to come back, Richard, with updates, maybe on other projects that you're working on. And um, yeah. We, we are so thankful that you came here to share. Well, thank and, you so uh, much. Uh, it's been a great pleasure with all this really, really expert question. I think that's also, you know, very inspiring talk. So it's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming and asking great questions. Maybe even, you know, having new projects after this so uh it was an amazing room i really appreciate everyone here and um yeah i hope i hear you all back soon we'll have um tomorrow quantum physics room related to uh quantum consciousness there are some new results from like um 
a real world uh, experiments and it's kind of not looking that good for the quantum consciousness theories out there but if you want to learn more and discuss it uh, come back tomorrow um, at 2 p.m um, EST so thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day evening morning wherever you are thank you thank you so much You're welcome bye bye everybody thank you guys thank you bye see you next time